I'm 40 feet below the Snake River, in the bowels of Idaho's Brownlee Dam, where hydropower is king. As a climate change reporter, I never expected Idaho to embrace green energy. But now, the largest utility company in one of the reddest states in the country has a 100% clean energy target. One of the things about hydro that is, is really um, beneficial is it's both clean and it's flexible. So when the sun starts to go down, you can release water, you can produce energy from hydro, and that helps you get to that clean future. Historically, there would have been salmon and steelhead by the thousands running through downtown Boise. It has been lost for so long. Again, I don't want to place all the blame on Idaho Power, but without these three dams, these fish would have continued their life cycle. Climate change is not something that's off on the horizon. Climate change is here now and affecting our daily lives. Are hydropower dams a valuable source of climate-friendly energy? Or are they a fish-killing monstrosity that should be torn down? In this episode of Repowering the West, we spent a week in Idaho trying to answer those questions and asking what the rest of us can learn from Idaho's hydropower dilemma. Hydropower dams are one of the oldest and largest sources of renewable energy. They work by using river water to turn turbines, which spin generators and produce electricity. But while hydropower only accounts for 6% of America's electricity, in Idaho it can make up as much as half. Idaho Power Company operates 17 dams on the Snake River and its tributaries. Those dams are a big reason the utility decided to target 100% clean energy, despite being in a deep red state. A lot of it was driven by our customers asking for it. So we sort of said, well, what would it look like if we went there? Coal was becoming very, uh, bringing a lot of risk. So we sort of looked at it from a risk perspective, looked at it from a customer perspective, and found out we think we can get there. I mean, hydro is the backbone of your system, right? And was crucial to your making this 100% commitment. So what would your response be to someone who would come in here and say, hydropower is, is not clean energy because of the damage it does. There really isn't a resource that doesn't have some kind of environmental impact. How can we improve the river system with the dams in place? You know, we have fish hatcheries. We really are committed to follow the science. This is a hatchery where we spawn and initially rear steelhead eggs. And then we move the eggs from this facility to one of our larger hatcheries to actually raise the young fish until they're ready to be released. But even with the fish hatcheries, Idaho Power's dams have played a role in dramatically reducing salmon and steelhead trout populations. As far as some tribal and environmental activists are concerned, many of those dams never should have been built. The Snake River is an incredibly sacred place, and what it's become is, you know, really tragic. There's no salmon, there's no steelhead. They can't get by these, these dams. No. Knowing that you work so closely with the tribes, what's it like for you, I mean, being here and seeing the reservoir and seeing what the river is like? Honestly, it's, I didn't even want to come here today. I wanted to talk about it with you and I appreciate the opportunity. Sorry, I'm getting a little emotional, but um, it's really sad, like, my wife and our friends, they come up here and water ski in the summer and I won't come. Because um, it's just kind of the death now for our tribes. Tribal members and salmon are, historically they were one and the same. They, salmon are their creation story. It's unfortunate that this whole area isn't the same. There are fights across the American West over tearing down dams. But even if every dam were to stay up, we'd still need to build lots of solar farms and wind turbines to break our fossil fuel addiction. How big is this whole area that you've proposed wind turbines over? So you're looking at about 15 miles east and west and about 10 miles north and south. Uh, the BLM alternatives really have reduced that developable area. Um, they've accounted for up to a five to 10 mile setback from the Minidoka National Historic Site. And that in turn reduces the number of turbines that could be uh, developed here on the landscape. Like most renewable energy projects, the Lava Ridge Wind Farm faces local opposition. Nearby residents are worried about possible harm to wildlife, ranchers, and more. 
what's it been like as a company sort of working through those concerns and uh, you know trying to come to resolutions with folks? Yeah, you know, it's, it, it comes with the territory, right? With, with this industry, how can we shape this project to be sensitive to those concerns? It's going to be a change on the landscape, and that's, that's hard to always address. Again, it comes down to what's the right balance. At the same time, this country needs energy, right? We need to find those right places for this type of infrastructure. There are those places, it's hard to find them, but once we do, let's make the most of it. Let's make the most of the wind resource if it's here. Not far from the proposed wind farm is Minidoka National Historic Site, which commemorates more than 13,000 Japanese Americans who were imprisoned here during World War II. Some of the historic site's protectors say the wind farm would permanently alter the landscape and change the experience of visiting Minidoka. Why is the viewshed and the, the emptiness so important to preserving this place? Minidoka was built here because it was land that was out in the middle of nowhere. The solemnity of this site is basically based on the serenity, the isolation, that nobody wanted to have anything to do with. And it was seen as a place to lock up all these Japanese and Japanese Americans who were a threat to the security of the United States. When I think about all of the indignities, then I know I have to do whatever I can to preserve this site in their memory because it's an affront to their dignity and their humanity that people could ruin the viewshed, ruin the entire area for money because that's what it's about. But there are other sites that they could use. You think it would be okay to build some wind elsewhere, just not? Not here at Minidoka. Not here in Minidoka. Would you put wind turbines over uh, the memorial for Flight 93? Or would you put it over the Washington Monument or around the Mall or around Gettysburg? For the Japanese American community, it feels it's the same feeling that we need to preserve the sacredness of the site and how, um, and, and actually respect the um, experiences of the people who are incarcerated here. Justin Hayes is fighting hard for Idaho to stop burning fossil fuels. He took me to Dedication Point, part of the Snake River Birds of Prey National Conservation Area. The view was spectacular. And so this area has one of the highest concentrations of birds of prey in all of North America. It's really important habitat for raptors, eagles, falcons. Idaho Power wanted to build an electric line near here, but a compromise route was agreed on to protect sage-grouse habitat and avoid the worst environmental damage. That kind of compromise is crucial to building the huge amounts of clean energy infrastructure that's needed to avoid climate catastrophe. I don't think we need to make a sacrifice here. And we can find opportunities to make energy in ways that are not killing fish, that are not driving cultures out, that are not violating treaties. And we can do it in a way that is better for the environment and better for the people of the Pacific Northwest. We've had two of the worst droughts in, in the history of our company in the last two years, then followed by a record year of snow. And we're seeing much hotter summer. And so we're working really hard to adapt and, and mitigate. And, and try to lower the risk um, as best we can. This is all of our lands. I think that is just something that we've lost as a country. And what happens here truly does have impacts worldwide. This is a pretty special place. And as we try and figure out how we restore areas and how we develop other areas so that we can be meeting our renewable energy needs, we do need to be striking an important balance. But we also need to be urgently addressing climate change. Compromises are going to need to be made in both directions, and we're going to have to find middle ground. I've spent the week asking questions about Idaho, but the answers are relevant to the broader American West. We're all part of the same electric grid. The more climate-friendly power on that grid, the easier it will be for all of us, red state or blue, to keep our air conditioners running during the next heat wave without fossil fuels. The more hydropower dams we tear down, the harder that will be but the more salmon might make it upstream.
I've had a great time this week exploring the beautiful state of Idaho. We've spent the last year traveling all over the Western United States telling stories about the energy transition. For more from this series and to see future installments, go to latimes.com slash repoweringthewest.